Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this talk. My name is Alexander Drzewski, and I'd like to share with you how we approach rendering of the open world London in Watch Dogs Legion. Before we get started, I want to preface this presentation by saying that I'm honored to talk to you about rendering technology of our game. Topics discussed here are not a contribution of a single person, but rather a collective achievement of the whole graphics team, which are spanned across multiple locations in Toronto, Kiev, Paris, and Montreal. This team had put tremendous amount of work into Watch Dogs Legion renderer, and the credit should be shared with all team members. I hope you'll find the information presented during this talk interesting and useful. First of all, I'd like to mention the goals of this presentation, which are to give you a bird's eye view on our rendering systems, their interconnections and dependencies. From my experience, it's relatively easy to find information about a specific rendering technique implementation in papers, slides, etc. But it's significantly harder to find information about the integration of such techniques and all the implications of having them in your frame. Also, we want to share with you implementation details about few core rendering systems developed to achieve high visual quality bars set by our direction team for near future London. And of course, to propose you some tips, tricks, and key learners we gathered during our work on the game. But what is Watch Dogs Legion? It's an open world action adventure game set in futuristic London. It was started with the technology from Watch Dogs 2, which had a good set of features and pipelines to build urban open world games. But it had several limitations and problems as well, and they became obvious over the course of shipping Watch Dogs 2. Moreover, there was a strong desire to improve on many visual features and to push graphics much further. It's especially true for rendering features which form the iconic visual signature of London, such as volumetric lighting, multi tiers reflection system, and other. In the end, Watch Dogs Legion had much more rendering features packed in the frame if compared to Watch Dogs 2, and it became clear that significant effort will be required on the performance optimization side to handle added improvements to existing features and to accommodate newly developed functionality. We'll start our journey by taking a quick run through the Watch Dogs Legion render. Next, we'll dive into implementation details of volumetric lighting, multi tier reflections, and temporal upsampling and dynamic resolution systems. Over the course of this presentation, we'll make a few stops here and there to cover key learnings and performance optimization opportunities and suggestions. And now let's jump to Watch Dogs Legion render overview. Here you can see simplified, although complete, schematic representation of our frame. Please don't try to see the individual blocks here. We'll be zooming into the frame in a few seconds. The intent of having this graph is to show the number of individual systems needed to render our open world and to give a sense of dependencies and ordering for these systems. The first part of our frame focused on several GPU simulation passes, debuffer generation, and shadows rendering. Each pass here is color coded based on the queue where it runs. We'll cover different queues and tracks on next slides. Next, frame processing moves to direct and indirect lighting, volumetric lighting, screen space reflections, and refractions. Finally, the frame processing finished with the forward leap objects rendering, post processing stack, cube maps rendering, and UI. This image represents more of a real life frame captured in peaks on Xbox One base. We'll use this image to introduce the concept of tracks. At the very top of this image, you can see the graphics track represented by blue color, so that you can find the correlation between this image and the schematic view presented in the previous slide. Graphics track acts like a kind of a main thread on CPU side. It orchestrates all other queues, kicks off tasks to compute and memory tracks, and ensures synchronization. Next, we have three compute tracks. Some of them have limited resources available for tasks, and some are driven by CPU. More details on this will be shared in following slides. And finally, there are two memory tracks running DMA engines to deal with different resources, copy, clear operation, resources streaming, etc. And now we'll make a quick sprint through many different systems executed on graphics track exclusively. We'll be going through most of the systems in chronological order so that you can follow them on schematic frame view or on the pix capture presented on this image. Frame starts with rain occlusion top-down map generation. It's rendered in relatively small resolution and only specially tagged objects or specially placed frame occluders rendered into it. The map used heavily by many systems throughout the frame. For example, on GPU, it's used to mask surfaces wetness level, to block rain particles, etc. On CPU, this map used by gameplay system to detect if NPCs need to use umbrellas and so on and so forth. On the left side of the slide, you can see an example of rain particles being blocked by the map. Next, we run long range shadows rendering. The long range shadow system used to generate shadows for areas beyond the range covered by cascaded shadow maps. This system maintained a very high resolution atlas which covers entire London. The atlas updated in tiles, and each frame a tile selected based on priority, then dedicated column process selects objects which must be rendering for it, 
and the actual rendering of the tile happens. In this slide, we'd like to highlight the contribution of the atlas generated by this system. Please try to pay extra attention on the buildings on the background as well as on the London's eye wheel. And to disable long range shadow system, all the objects which are not covered by CSM are treated as shadowed, and that's why they turn dark. As you can hopefully see, and I'll switch between on and off slides a few times, long grain shadow system has significant effect on shadows presence on the screen. Then frame enters GPU-based simulation section. The section contains a system such as tree and uh, vegetation displacement simulation, fluid simulation, GPU particle simulation, water and Archimede simulation. In the following slides, I'll show you the visual appearance of different effects simulated by dimension systems. It's most likely somewhat obvious, but tree simulation and vegetation displacement simulation brings trees, bushes, and grass to life by making them react on the wind conditions, local forces, etc. One of the most prominent effects of fluid simulation can be observed after a rain when there is a lot of puddles in London. The system helped to implement effects such as water waves and trails caused by moving cars, walking characters, and different props falling into puddles. Then the GPU particle simulation system runs, which is used for many system, systemic effects spawned in London either by gameplay system or procedural code. On this image, you can see the leaves falling off the trees. Uh, these leaves, for example, are GPU particles simulated by the system. Finally, the water and Archimedes simulation system takes care of water flow simulation, bion simulation, etc. Here you can see a few boats on the Thames with a physically plausible bion simulation, as well as water surface displacement simulation caused by bigger ships. Next stop is the GBuffer generation. GBuffer in Watch Dogs Legion is relatively fat and contains six textures called layers in our engine. In order to control bandwidth and computational cost of GBuffer generation, we split all layers in two groups, permanent layers and optional layers. Permanent layers contain the minimal set of textures needed to render the simplest object to the GBuffer. They are active throughout the entire GBuffer generation process, and optional layers are bound on demand when a specific object requires them to store all the surface parameters needed later in the frame. A bit of details about GBuffer rendering. As you can see from this slide, GBuffer rendering contains several subpasses called buckets. All instances to be rendered in the scene bucketized based on required features. Buckets which can render alpha tested objects employ local par uh, partial depth free paths. Moreover, each bucket optimized for local overdraw, bandwidth, etc. Bucket order to finish GBuffer sub resources as early as possible. For example, buckets which don't need depth rights move to the very end of the GBuffer path so that depth stencil layer can be used for reading orally. This gives a lot of freedom for compute track scheduling by widening window of opportunities. Then the frame continued by environment prop generation path. The environment prop is somewhat low resolution, 256 by 256 pixels, paraboloid projected map, which follows camera position. It's rendered every frame and contains information needed to correctly represent sky lighting, sky occlusion, etc. The probe used for environment lighting evaluation, and it's also blended in LCM and camera cube maps to represent sky and clouds. And I'll talk a bit more about it in multi-tier reflection system section. Next, the merged path of depth and multi-resolution processing starts. This path generates different versions of depth buffer and some buffers based on depth information, such as circle of confusion parameters buffer. It also results velocity for static pixels and camera motion. It worth to mention that buffer generated by the path used by many systems such as screen space reflections, volumetric fog, tile motion blur, and others. Then we go to shadow, uh, shadow maps generation passes. Uh, for global shadows, we use conventional cascaded shadow maps with four cascades. Um, we don't have any sort of depth buffer ranges uh, read back on CPU to fit cascade ranges better to a scene content. Instead, fixed distribution of cascades used. And as was mentioned previously, long range shadows employ to cover areas beyond CSM range. For local lights, we use a combination of static and dynamic shadow maps. Static shadow maps back during offline processing as VSM. At the same time, we render up to eight dynamic shadow maps each frame. And static shadow maps used as a fallback if we either can't afford to render shadow maps in runtime or if it's been decided that runtime generation is not needed for a specific light. Finally, screen space local shadows executed for selected surface types to get fine grained shadow details. Next, the screen space direct occlusion system runs. This system is a variation of widely known screen space ambient occlusion approaches. The main difference, though, is that it estimates direct light in occlusion. 
This decision was pushed by our direction team in order to solve several light leaking issues. Specifically, it helped us to deal partially with light leaking on characters, etc. The SSDO pass combines baked occlusion volumes with very large occlusion in screen space. In watch the legion, we have many baked occlusion volumes made for characters, vehicles, etc. It's worth to note that there is no apply pass in this system. Instead, each consumer reads directly from occlusion buffer. For example, it's done by systems like direct and indirect lighting, volumetric lighting, and others. Next up is deferred shadow system. The primary, the primary goal of this system is to project shadowing information from shadow map spaces to screen space. This way, we can offload expensive shadow sampling and shadow filtering from deferred lighting passes, which are known to be extremely tight on occupancy and ALU operation size. For global shadows, they are projected to so-called sun shadows buffer, which contains not just shadow mask, but extra parameters needed to improve blending between different cascades. For local lights, we use somewhat fat local shadows buffer, which is a R32 G32 texture to store up to eight overlapping shadow masks. Although on some platforms, we use even bigger buffer to store up to 16 overlapping shadows. The shadow mask packing approach is rather simple, and you can see it at the very bottom of the slide here. Then the frame continued by clustered lighting system. It's based on quite classic approach to deferred lighting with clustered light calling. Processing starts with hierarchical cluster calling for lights. Additionally, system calls and assigns other volumetric entities to clusters. For example, it assigns local cube maps for image-based lighting. Then two-dimensional tiles classification processing kicks in to assign predefined tile types used later in indirect light computation steps. For example, some tiles can be assigned a tag of car paint material plus all light types and some others. The system supports wide range of materials and light types. For materials, it supports generic car paint, skin, clothes, and many other types. For light, it supports omnidirectional, spot, capsule, quad, and area lights. It works to mention that lighting passes are split in two groups, base and extended passes. Base passes can output either final lighting values or decoupled diffuse and specular lighting values. Extended passes, if they present, use data generated by base passes as input. For example, in case of screen space subsurface scattering, base passes compute diffuse specular lighting and store these intermediate values to run SSS lighting in extended pass on the same tiles. Next, we have a set of passes focused on semi-transparent objects rendering. As you hopefully can see from the image on this slide, the near future London contains a lot of holograms, particle effects, etc. In order to be able to process a high number of semi-transparent objects within a tight performance constraints, we decided to implement multi-resolution rendering technique based on MSAA optimized transparencies presented at Digital Dragons Conference a few years ago. The idea is somewhat simple. It's to control the cost of semi-transparent objects rendering on per object level. In many cases, it's fine to invoke pixel shader evaluation only once for four neighboring pixels and still run the depth test on each pixel. This way, we can trade some very minor visual quality for a great performance saving. To set up such a possibility, we must receive a light buffer and depth to half resolution buffers in each dimension with 4x MSAA enabled. With programmable MSAA sample locations, we can perfectly align MSAA samples with pixels and upscale the image. One can wonder why we convert light buffer instead of rendering semi-transparencies to dedicated buffer and then simply blending them into a scene. And the reason is non-monochromatic transmittance support needed for some semi-transparent objects, which makes it impossible to switch to a blending modes needed for the dedicated semi-transparent buffer approach. It's important to mention that conventional conversion to MSAA buffer and from MSAA buffers uh, fully amortized by other systems, and it's effectively free for us. Previously mentioned setup gives us possibility to control pixel shader invocation rate per draw or per pass if we need. In most cases, switching to pixel level evaluation for a specific object makes it about 2.7, 3.7 times cheaper, but it highly depends on geometry complexity. Moreover, each switch to from per pixel or per sample invocation rate generates a, a context role on GPU, which in turn leads to many GPU bubbles in semi-transparent objects rendering passes. To minimize the effect of these bubbles, we try to overlap as much work as possible on compute tracks so that gaps can be filled by effective computations. Finally, the post-processing stack appears at the very end uh, of the frame generation. Our post-processing stack contains a number of permanent and optional passes. Permanent passes run each frame and their visual appearance controlled by input parameters, which make them visible or not. And optional passes, on the other hand, are driven by gameplay logic and can be switched on and off. Now let's go quickly through the system designed around compute tracks usage. A small note that we'll skip polymetric clouds and temporal AA upscaling systems which are paramount users of high 
uh, priority compute tracks, for example, and they will be covered in great details later. There are three compute tracks implemented for Watchdogs Legion, the high priority compute track, the low priority compute track, and CPU immediate compute track. Compute tracks used extensively by many systems. It's one of the major reasons for our frames to fit into our budget. We observed, uh, we observed savings around 12 to 16 percent, depending on the platforms, and that's why test tracks are extremely important to achieve good performance. Confetti system is one of the systems primarily running on compute tracks. If you're confused by the name, Confetti is a name for our GPU particles. Simulation starts on the graphics track right after weather post effects. Initial uh, setup is done in reset simulation subpaths, after which the actual simulation kicked off to compute track. Here we run simulation for the next frame, and because the results of simulation are not needed in current frame, everything is synchronized back on graphics track by the end of the frame. Next system runs on low priority compute track. Depth down sample system starts in the middle of gbuffer pass on graphics track once the depth stencil layer writes are done. On compute track, we run two subpasses, actual down sample subpass and depth offset generation subpass. The former one is the self-explanatory by its name. The later one produces the mask, which helps to drive up sampling for passes relying on half resolution depth buffer. Next on clustered lighting scheduling. The clustered light calling and tiles classification kicked off after depth finalization subpass, which is a part of the depth down sampling process mentioned just before, and synchronized back on graphics track before the volumetric fog preparation subpass, because called lights used as an input for volumetric fog lighting. And of course, results of the calling and classification used later in the frame for deferred lighting subpasses. Volumetric fog system is yet another user of a low priority compute track. It's used to run most of the volumetric fog simulation and lighting integration. Compute tracks used to execute density volume injection for camera aligned voxels. It's also used to evaluate volumetric shadows and GI contribution to evaluate direct lighting and finally to integrate lighting. Volumetric fog system synchronized back on graphics track by the time it must be applied in the main lighting buffer. Flight simulation execution pattern follows confetti simulation covered a few minutes ago. It runs simulation for the next frame and that's why synchronized by the frames and simulation steps include evaluation of curl effects or TCT effects, advection effects, divergence effects, and actual diffusion, which is executed in many subpasses. The wetness occlusion processing system is an example of the cooperation between all track types. The goal of this system is to resolve rain occlusion map, which is used by CPU and GPU. Processing starts on graphics track by running preparation subpaths. Then execution flow moved to low priority compute track to perform the actual resolve. And once it's done, the flow moves back to immediate memory track to compute resolved badness occlusion mask to CPU and visible memory and actually copy it. The last system running on compute track is the CPU driven compute visibility system. It's based on anti portal calling approach and it's used for main view, sun shadows, long range shadows, and reflections. It works in a way that CPU generates a set of objects which are streamed in, kicks off calling process for this uh, set on GPU. Next, GPU reads data and outputs visibility mask for each object in the original set. The process finished by CPU reading produced data back and finally using it to schedule draw dispatches for the current frame. As you can notice, this, in, uh, this system has no interconnections with other tasks running on GPU within the same frame. To be exact, the GPU works on two different frames at this scenario. Because of that, there is no synchronization between tasks running on CPU immediate compute tracks and other tracks. Now to conclude the overview, we'll share a few words regarding the memory tracks. Memory tracks primarily operate on DMA engines. Streaming memory track uses the dedicated DMA engine for textures, MIP streaming, and for special resources upstreaming and readback operations. Immediate memory track, is, in contrast, uses two DMA engines. Common processor DMA engine used for small memory moves such as constant buffers, small resources, etc. Yet another dedicated DMA engine used to asynchronously clear persistent resources and copy some transient resources. It worth to mention that this setup varies greatly depending on platforms. As you probably know, some platforms have more DMA engines available than others, but the general approach stays the same. Here I'd like to share with you some performance numbers taken on Xbox One base console when all rendering systems uh, run on graphics track. The intent of showing these numbers is to give you a sense of relative cost of each covered system and to act as a comparison reference if you want to implement similar solution or try something similar in your render. Important note, as you can see, the median total frame time is about 38 milliseconds, which of course can't fit into the 30 FPS game frame budget. 
Usage of the secondary tracks, compute tracks, and memory tracks helped us to save about 14% of the total frame time on Xbox One base, which saves us roughly 5.2 milliseconds of total frame time and puts it under the budget. This concludes the Watchdog Legion render overview section, but before moving on, I'd like to emphasize on a few key learnings, which hopefully will be useful for you. First of all, try to design your frame structure around dependencies between your systems and not around the conventional or desired execution place for a given system. This will help you to maximize the distance between dependent passes. Uh, in turn, this should offer you a lot of flexibility for asynchronous execution. Second, it's important to realize that modern GPUs are very wide and it's a challenge to keep them busy with useful work all the time. Of course, small dispatches, draws, synchronization, and so on are inevitable. To combat GPU underutilization during these moments, we must use other GPU queues available in hardware. Finally, if you decide to go for somewhat complex queues usage like ours, please consider implementing the possibility to select execution queues and to tweak execution limiters and runtime. It's a vital tool for performance tuning and execution process polishing, which helps you to get most of the GPU. Now I'd like to share with you some details about our volumetric lighting solutions. Short note that when I planned the talk, I wanted to cover two volumetric lighting components in this section, fog and clouds. Unfortunately, because of the presentation time constraints and the lack of major novelty in volumetric fog tech, it's been decided to focus on clouds only. Hopefully it will be of a greater interest to you. Let's jump to volumetric cloud system right away. But before diving into the details of the volumetric cloud lighting model, I'd like to take a moment and explain why it was decided to spend precious GPU and memory resources for it when old, no, old school uh, skybox solutions work okayish in many cases. First, we wanted our clouds to realistically support dynamic time of a day change as well as weather transitions. Second, we wanted the clouds to be a real first class citizen effect and be a part of the world. For example, we want to have an effect that if you see a unique cloud floating about the skyscraper in London, then it will be right above you when you travel to that building. A quick overview of the cloud lighting model. Our lighting extension, uh, extension computation based on beer lambert law, the in-scattering computation takes into account light coming from sun, sky, and lighting uh, reflected from the ground. Coronet Shanks uh, phase function applied for all these scattering events to estimate the ratio of it coming light in to outscattered light in camera direction. And of course, the single scattering is just a small fraction of the light simulation needed for proper cloud lighting. The light can reach the camera after a number of scattering events. Because of that, multiple scattering simulation is a must have. To simulate the clouds, we cover entire London with several 3D textures. These textures form a complex caching architecture that is used to pre-compute as much information as possible and to offload most of the lighting computation from the expansive main trace pass. As you remember from the previous slides, these caches must cover a simulation area of 20 by 20 kilometers. The simulation area size decided based on the world size requirement for the London and to conservatively cover average distance to the horizon, which is about five kilometers when seen from the ground level. At the same time, artists decide how many layers of cloud they want to have, and that drives minimum and maximum heights for simulation. Let's go through each simulation cache. The control texture drives cloud shapes injection in simulation caches. It controls where clouds must be placed, what types of clouds must be used for placement, and what blending must be applied. This texture decides on whether transition between different clouds volumes, etc. Here you can see how the uh, control texture can look like at different height levels. The density cache stores the average voxel uh, particles density and density variance. The density values used for cloud shapes representation and simulation, while the density variance values used mainly to optimize ray marching steps and also to ensure they are conservative enough to not miss the cloud details. The density cache is used as a fast way to fetch cloud particle density in transmittance cache simulation paths and multi-scattering cache simulation paths. Here you can see how the density cache can look like at different height levels. The density cache simulation uh, updated in tiles. Each frame will simulate only one by 16 cache area, which means that we need 16 frames to fully update the cache. The transmittance cache uh, stores relative transmittance values for the sun, lighting and for the sky lighting. Ground lighting packed together with sun transmittance. This cache uh, used heavily by multi-scattering cache simulation paths and the main trace paths. Again, here you can see how the transmittance, uh, transmittance cache can look like at different height levels. <laughs> 
To compute the transmittance values for the cache, we run a quick ray march for each light contributor. For the sun moon transmittance computation, we run ray marching with 24 exponentially placed steps toward the sun. For the sky transmittance computation, we run three ray marches directed evenly in upper hemisphere for eight exponential steps each. And for the ground transmittance computation, we run ray marching with eight exponential steps toward the ground. It's worth to mention that transmittance cache follows this exact same update strategy as the density cache. The final cache in the architecture is the multiple scattering cache. This cache has the same size and voxels as the other caches, but effectively it consists of two textures where one used as an intermediate buffer for the flux diffusion uh, algorithm. The cache stores flux limited diffusion and fluence for sun, moon, and sky. Stored values are used by the main trace pass directly. Again, here you can see how the multiple scattering cache can look like at different height levels. The multiple scattering cache uh, uses the same update strategy as other caches, so it takes 16 frames to run one step of diffusion algorithm for the entire cache, but because of the essence of the flux limited diffusion algorithm, it takes a lot of time to converge to a stable result. In most cases, it takes about 256 frames for full stabilization for a cold cache. Each update step requires two diffusion passes applied in 3 the checkerboard pattern. This way we can avoid expansive cache coping each frame. And that's why we have the intermediate buffer in the multiple scattering cache architecture. The multiple scattering cache update marks the end of the volumetric cloud simulation. Once the simulation is done, we can finally use the pre-computed data to run two trace passes. The first trace pass is ambient trace pass. It's used to produce paraboloid projected map with volumetric clouds. This map centered at the camera position and used as an input to two systems, ambient prop generation system, which was covered a few minutes ago, and paraboloid sky generation system, which will be covered in a few minutes. It's important to mention that the map has relatively low resolution of 256 by 256 pixels. It's used, the, it's used in simplified trace algorithm, and the entire map updated in tiles to make processing cost as low as possible. The second trace pass is the main trace. It's a tiled pass used to generate volumetric clouds buffer for the main view. The main trace starts with the tile calling and indirect arguments preparation for the ray marching and post-processing stacks. Then the optimized ray marching path runs to produce the row output buffer. Next, the stack of three post-processing filters executed on row output buffer to prepare the final volumetric clouds buffer, which will be used for composition with the main lighting buffer. Now let's cover the core subpasses in the main trace. Everything starts with the pre-trace tile calling. This subpass exploits some constraints of the volumetric cloud system to make subsequent ray march subpass performant. There are a few constraints on the system which make pre-trace tile calling subpass applicable. First, there is no need to be able to fly into a cloud, and second, there is no need to have geometry or any other effects behind clouds. This makes it possible to split the screen in small tiles, call the tiles against the depth buffer to select tiles which contain sky, and then run ray marsh only for tiles which survived calling. As you can imagine, city environment offers great sky occlusion possibilities. Such calling allows us to save a ton of computations on tiles which will not be visible at all. It helped to save about 37% of the ray march cost in average on previous gener generation of consoles. Then the actual ray march happens for selected tiles. Here, the next optimization applied, which is tiled quote ray march. The core idea of this optimization is to let one thread to process four neighboring rays instead of a single ray. This approach allows to share most cache inputs, such as transmittance values, control values, and others, and diverge only on values unique for each thread, such as high frequency noise values and scattering values and others. This optimization is not intuitive at the first glance. It causes increase in use registers and ALU operations uh, by a single thread, but because in the end we have four times less threads to run, it results in much less bandwidth pressure and ALU pressure overall. Tile quote ray march optimization helped us to save about 27% of the total ray march cost. Unfortunately, despite all the optimizations and savings mentioned before, much more savings are still needed to justify the usage of volumetric cloud system. So we decided to add temporal reprojection technique um, on, uh, on the tile quad ray marching. Only half of the quads processed each frame. Extra care taken to ensure there is no idle threads in each wave. Instead of simply bailing out in the thread, which must not be, uh, not be traced, uh, this frame, the quad location 
computation code modified so that each thread is active in a way, although they work on the bit sparsely located quotes. It has minimal impact on the cache usage, but overall performance saving is around um, 31 per second, 31 percent on top of what we had already. The rain march uh, happens in so-called three component trace subpaths. This pass combines three light contributors, sky and ground components, which are touched from the multiple scattering cache, and sun component, which is ray marched in place. The ray march passes uh, produces uh, the row output buffer. This buffer suffers from several artifacts, unfortunately, such as density undersampling, block artifacts from the tile quad ray marching, and gap filling artifacts. The post process stack sub passes used to eliminate these artifacts and smooth out the final volumetric clouds buffer. Filters applied in the stack are median filter, blur filter, and sharpen filter. All filters applied in tiles, so we reuse indirect dispatch arguments for the ray march. And that, this way, the filtering cost is not wasted on tiles without uh, ray march clouds. Now let's make a quick run through the filtering processes uh, with a bit of closer look. Here you can see an example of the row ray marching buffer entering the post processing stack as an input. First, the median filter executed to get rid of the noise. Then the blur filter with a small kernel used to combat under sample and tiled quote ray marching artifacts and temporal reprojection artifacts. And finally, the sharpened filter applied to ensure that we recover all the tiny details which might be conservatively blurred away by the previous subpass. The composition pace uh, takes care of sky and cloud integration into the main lighting buffer. It combines physically based sky model, cirrus clouds made of simple planar cloud textures and volumetric clouds. The conservative tile generation process mentioned before makes it possible to compose clouds in the scene with simple and efficient depth testing. There is no need for um, depth aware upsampling or any other fancy upscaling algorithm. Now let's take a moment to see what visual results can be produced by the system. Here you can see the volumetric cloud systems in action at different time of a day, the different weather conditions and their combinations. As was promised here, here we are going to cover volumetric cloud system scheduling scheme. The entire system runs mainly on high priority compute track. The system starts by spawning asynchronous tasks at the beginning of the frame. This is possible because there is no dependencies on current frame information in simulation and ambient trace passes. The first portion of the execution on compute track synchronized back by graphics track by the time of ambient prop generation and the results from ambient trace used there. The second portion of execution kicked off after depth pr processing and synchronized back much later in a frame when volumetric clouds composition must be performed. In fact, the compose pass is the only pass running on graphics track. Obviously, the contention created by other volumetric clouds passes running on compute tracks makes some tasks on graphic track a bit slower. So the right way to estimate the cost of volumetric cloud system is to run two frames with the exact same setup, one with systems enabled and one with the system disabled. In most cases, the median frame time difference for this way of measurement is about 0.2 milliseconds when measured on Xbox One base. There are some more details about individual passes performance when they run on graphics track without any limiters. In this scenario, the total cost of the system is about 1.7 milliseconds. So if compared to the numbers when compute tracks enabled, it highlights that about 89% of the system cost was saved, making the system virtually free. That's pretty much it for the volumetric clouds rendering in Watchdogs Legion. Again, before moving to the next topic, I'd like to mention a few tips and tricks we learned over the course of volumetric cloud system implementation and simulation. The system helped us to achieve all the goals we set originally, but it also made it possible to implement a few other visual improvements, such as cloud shadows, god rays, general sun and sky occlusion, and others. And many optimizations needed to make the system applicable in real-time render. So we suggest you to experiment with the optimization techniques covered in the previous slide, they work great for us, and probably they will work for you as well. We also suggest to push hard for compute track usage. Volumetric cloud system is a good fit for asynchronous computation scheme, and it helped us to save a lot of frame time. Next, we'll dive into details of the multi-tier reflection system implementation in Watchdogs Legion. Firstly, there is a small uh, issue here. The multi-tier reflection system is not a single system, but rather a collection of systems working together. The systems classified by so-called tiles or tires, um, where each tier uh, focused on the reflection at a specific scale or 
on a specific feature of the reflections. Namely, these tiers are uh, screen space reflections, ray trace reflections, cube map reflections, and environment reflections, which are used as a supplement for uh, cube map reflections. Tiers follow the cascaded fallback approach. Uh, first, the screen space reflection tier used to produce final reflections buffer. It traces in screen space uh, in screen space, and if a trace succeeds, then results can be used right away. Otherwise, the RT world trace kicks in. If trace succeeds in this case, then results used. Otherwise, the local cube map um, search performed to find the best candidate for reflection approximation. If good candidate found, use it. Otherwise, we fall back to the camera cube map. One might have a question. Uh, why screen space trace executed prior to RT world trace? Well, we want to trace as few expansive rays as possible and RT rays are expansive. And the screen space trace is much cheaper and faster. So it's, if it's possible to have reliable reflection information from screen space, uh, we'll use it. Moreover, to make RT performance manageable, we must keep BVH sizes as short as possible. For that reason, only a small fraction of the entire map kept in BVH. As a result, most distant dynamic animated objects are either not present in BVH or added to the BVH when the objects become really close to the camera, causing popping. And screen space trace helps with these constraints a lot. A few details about the screen space reflection process. The system runs in multiple stages, coarse ray march for so-called big tiles, ray march tiles resolve, and temporal reconstruction and application stages. The coarse ray march stage performs a ray march of so-called big tiles in extremely low resolution, one by six in each dimension. The goal uh, of this path is to identify what big tiles potentially have correct hits at pixel level and compute parameters for the following result path. Next, the big tiles which had hits used to resolve ray marches uh, result in pixel level. Here, a simple ray versus plane intersection test runs based on the pre-computed parameters. After this path, the first row output buffer is available. Then the temporal reconstruction stage executed in order to combine the row output buffer with accumulated history buffer. This stage helps to fill the gaps caused by lack of information in screen space and to improve or stabilize visual quality of the final reflections buffer. The application stage is the final stage in the processing chain. It reads the final reflections buffer and applies indirect specular lighting in the main lighting buffer. Most of the stages covered in the previous slides are running in tiles by default. Here by default, we mean the execution without ray tracing functionality. If ray tracing pipeline is enabled, then all stages executed in non-tiled fashion for performance reasons. And if tiled execution enabled, then each stage has its own tile type. And the first tiled stage is result stage. On the image here, you can see the different tile types encoded in colors. For the result stage, there are three different tile types. There are called tiles, uh, no result happening for these tiles as there, are, there is no way to have reflections there. There are tiles with uh, heat in big tiles and the result needed and will be running for them. And there are tiles without heat in big tiles and no result needed. The next uh, tile stage is the temporal reconstruction stage. It's relatively simple tiling approach as it has only two tile types, tiles which require temporal reconstruction and tiles which can't use temporal reconstruction because of the seclusion and other reconstruction related events. The final tiled stage is apply stage. It has quite a few tile types. On the image here, you can see most of the tile types encoded in different colors. The main types of the apply tiles are tiles which blend the final reflection buffer in, tiles which require material evaluation to apply indirect specular correctly and efficiently, tile subtypes used here, and tiles which have no information in final reflection buffer but have data in local cube maps and tile subtypes used here as well. Our next stop is the ray traced reflection pipeline. Voice of Legion supports ray traced reflections on PC, Xbox Series S and X and PlayStation 5 platforms. It's extremely important visual improvement for uh, the London recreated in our game. It helps to push few graphics areas identified by the R Direction team as a visual signature of the futuristic look of the city. On the technical side, we want uh, we had a strong desire to ensure that ray traced reflections will be fully physically based so that reflections will fit well with the lighting and shading on the rasterization pipeline. Also, we wanted to avoid any sort of special content authoring or modification specifically for ray traced pipeline as it conflicts uh, with the consistency goal. Finally, we wanted to ensure that no light adjustment will be needed for the ray tracing reflections.
Skipping forward that geometry processing in ray tracing pipeline, as it's widely covered in many other talks. Uh, let's imagine that we have the BBH is constructed for the scene. Now we need to fire rays and evaluate materials at hit positions. This wasn't easy in our case, as we have more than 200,000 of unique material shaders. So initially we started with a crazy idea to store one single value per instance, instance color, and pre-compute it in offline by running shaders. This approach can work surprisingly well for irregular or rough reflections. Obviously it falls short with, for mirror-like reflections, in the end, we expected we exposed the full set of features for our materials, including textures, unique instance constants, etc., and implemented the Uber shader approach with unified materials. That's it, one shader to handle all types of unique materials features via dynamic branching. The Uber shader shades the heat position and returns payload value, which contains value in a format of the G buffer. Dedicated RTG buffer used which is the same set of layers as the main G buffer. Next, the RTG buffer used as an input for the RT lighting pipeline stages. And to achieve the lighting consistency goal, almost all features of the rasterization lighting pipeline were recreated. Unfortunately, we can't reuse much from the rasterization lighting pipeline data as most rendering systems designed around the main camera view. This is true for shadow passes. In general case, it must be assumed that heat position shadows can't be reconstructed from authorization data. But in practice, existing shadowing data has enough coverage to represent shadows in most heat locations. Because of that, we start by checking heat position against the global shadow map cascade. If point is outside the CSM range, then try uh, long range shadows atlas, which rarely can be used for recreation. If shadows can't be fetched from the long range shadow atlas, then we launch a secondary ray towards the sun. And the occlusion stages can be easily recreated in our key lighting pipeline as well as we can't rely on screen space direct occlusion. Instead, only baked AO volumes and AO maps used for occlusion computation. Which occlusions interact diffuse pipeline built around probe-based approach. In rasterization lighting pipeline, probes around the view frost room gathered to generate a screen space in direct diffuse lighting buffer. Of course, the screen space buffer can't be used for RT lighting pipeline. We ended up modifying probe streaming logic to widen the area of active simulation for light probes. After that, we gathered probes with which potentially can affect heat positions. And instead of computing indirect diffuse lighting to a dedicated buffer, they are simply used in place during lighting evaluation. Because of the uh, similarity in G buffer structure, it's possible to run deferred lighting on our TG buffer. That's exactly what we do. We share the lighting code with minor modifications between rasterization and RT lighting pipelines. The main difference between two pipelines is the way how lights are clustered and fetched. For RT lighting pipeline, we use a simplified 3D grid around the camera with lights called assigned against voxels in this grid. At lighting stage, instead of reading lights from the frostum aligned hierarchical clusters, we read them from the 3D grid directly. For forward leap materials, we support simplified version of them. Supported material types include particles, holograms, and a few other which make a significant contribution to a frame in futuristic London. As for the indirect specular, we don't support full featured reflections in reflections. So the RT capability is used to shoot only primary reflection rays without recursion. But to achieve the light inconsistency goal, or at least to be as close to it as possible, we still need indirect diffuse and indirect specular. We rely on indirect specular approximation stored in local cube maps and camera cube map. So I've been mentioning local cube maps and camera cube map for a while now, but what are they in their application towards the collision at least? Uh, local cube maps contain pre-baked G buffer data captured at specific loca location in, in the world. These cube maps placed in key locations, landmarks, and specific locations important for gameplay. Uh, in runtime, pre-baked data used to relieve cube maps to make sure they are properly blended in, blended in the environment and lighting, and lighting corresponds to the time of the day, weather, etc. The camera cube map can be imagined as a local cube map, but unlike local cube map, it's constantly moving with camera and it generates G buffer data at runtime. The rest of the processing passes are the same for both local cube maps and camera cube map. It includes lighting, cube map normalization, ambient probe injection, important sampling, and others. Let's take a quick tour into cube map processing pass. The processing pass starts by acquiring compressed G buffer layers 
uh, dust layers are either pre-baked um, at data generation time for local QMAPs and or generated at runtime for camera QMAP. Next, the deferred lighting pass executed on acquired G buffer. After lighting, the MIP chain generation process started. This process takes care of ambient probe integration into a lead MIP chain. Next, the filtered important sampling process produces QMAP MIP chain convolved against our BRDF. And finally, the cube map normalization applied on top to combat the lack of directional lighting information at place of cube map capturing. This slide hopefully should give you a good sense of how the cube map processing looks like visually. Here we can see um, and follow the execution flow from compressed chip buffer to lighting to ambient prop blending to MIP chain generation to filtered important sampling. Here I'd like to show you the contribution of each tier covered in the previous slide. And first we have image with all reflections disabled. Then we add contribution of local cube maps and camera cube map and environment probe. Next we add screen space reflection contribution. And finally the ray trace reflections added to complete the picture. Now let's take a moment to see what visual results can be produced by the system. Here we can see the multi-tier reflection system running in a few different scenarios from day to night, from rough reflections to mirror-like reflections, from reflections on the water to reflections on glass. Now to the performance numbers. The total cost of the multi-tier reflection system on Xbox One Base is around five milliseconds. The passes you can see on this slide covers a subset of functionality implemented in the system. We run this subset of features on platforms which don't support ray tracing, such as previous generation of consoles. The full featured system cost on Xbox Series X takes about 6.75 milliseconds. It includes screen space reflections, RT reflections, and cube map based reflections. On this slide, you can see few real life cases where RT reflections bring a lot of visual quality to the scene. If RT passes measured in isolation from other passes, uh, then their numbers will be around 4.5 milliseconds for the left uh, case and about 2.4 milliseconds for the right case. And those numbers are taken on Xbox One, uh, on Xbox Series X. Finally, here are some uh, sort of details about the cost of each system running within the multi-tier reflections. These numbers are taken on Xbox Series X for the exact same frame. Only pipeline capabilities alternated to simulate non-RT pipeline and RT pipeline. Here we can notice the relation of the individual passes between different configurations of the pipeline. The cube map passes uh, uh, stays effective uh, the same in both cases, but screen space reflections passes adjusted depending on the RT passes existence. Now to conclude the multi-tier reflection system section, I'd like to share a few learnings and tips. Here I'll be focusing on ray tracing related learnings as it's relatively new area of development. It's not widely covered and hopefully will be much more interesting to you. First of all, try to offload as much computations as possible to data generation time. This includes bottom level acceleration structure building, etc. Second, keep your top level acceleration structure small and avoid overlapping instances in top level acceleration structure. This will greatly reduce ray traversal time. Third, keep rays short and try to minimize the number of rays for each frame. In this regard, consider using surface material parameters to drive the decision about how many rays per pixel or per tile you want to launch. Next, we learned that dedicated dynamic resolution system for RT buffers is a great tool to keep the ray budget consistent from frame to frame. And finally, Try to experiment with the custom BVH traversal code on platforms which support it. For example, by using heavily modified and tuned BVH traversal uh, compute shader on Xbox Series X, we achieved performance improvement of about 30%. Going to the last topic of this talk, which is a temporal upscaling and dynamic resolution system. For those of you who is not very familiar with the temporal accumulation and or dynamic resolution systems, here you can see a high level overview of this system. This graph represents our first implementation, and it also shows how the system looks like in many other games and engines. The temporal upscaling and dynamic resolution systems evolve from there. They are primarily uh, based on TAE framework pieces discussed many times in other talks, and based on features like Halton sequence subpixel jitter, exponential accumulation buffer, motion vector dilation, and color clamping. But on top of widely known features, Watch Dogs Legion added a bunch of improvements and optimizations. The most important ones are the Gaussian driven upscaling, the high confidence color clamping, the coupled reprojection, and resolve. We are going to cover this improvement and optimization in the following slides. So to render a scene, we have to decide on active resolution and active camera jitter parameters. 
The camera detection parameter selec selection process is quite standard. We use first eight samples of the Halton 2-3 uh, sequence and move between samples in cycles by iterating current frame index. As for the resolution selection process, we track time uh, times taken on GPU and CPU to process previous frames and build histograms of track timing. Then we use accumulated histogram value to precisely estimate GPU cost of going from one resolution to the other. If GPU frame time goes over, we quickly drop resolution to the estimated best resolution candidate. If GPU timing is back to the normal case, then we start to gradually increase resolution. Sometimes we allow GPU frame times to go about the budget without causing the resolution drop. It happens in case if CPU is above budget or special game mode selected. The resolution selection process controls sides of the internal buffer. Internal buffer resolution usually called an internal resolution. And if you remember uh, the post-processing stack slides from the rendering overview section, we were referring to the internal resolution there. Basically all full screen rendering that happens up until temporal upscaling step runs in internal resolution, which includes GBuffer generation, lighting, and others. Accumulation process takes care of blending internal buffer into exponential accumulation buffer, usually called history buffer for simplicity. This process triggers upscaling on an internal buffer. Let's look at an example of internal buffer upscaling from internal resolution to external resolution. Here we have an internal buffer on the left and the history buffer on the right. The two by two region in internal buffer must be upscaled to the three by three region in history buffer. To decide what samples rendering uh, this frame and what weights must be used to blend for a given pixel, we kind of project the three by three region from the history buffer on the two by two region in internal buffer. You can see an example of side projection on the right. Now let's imagine that we want to compute the value for the projected pixel in the middle. This projected pixel has no samples that can be used directly, so it must be reconstructed. For reconstruction, we tried many different upscaling techniques, but in the end, we decided to use Gaussian filter to gather samples in internal buffer for a given pixel. Gaussian curve controls weight for each sample which participates in uh, projected pixel reconstruction. The Gaussian curve for a given pixel depends on a uniform parameter such as internal buffer resolution and non-uniform parameters such as uh, history blending factor or history reprojection confidence. We use different parameters of, uh, for each pixel in order to get the best use of samples available in internal buffer, which in turn leads to the best visual quality with the manageable performance heat. Now we have the way to upscale internal buffer to the size of history buffer and can start blending current frame values with the previous frame values to achieve super sampling effect. The reprojection process helps um, to find and reuse valid samples in the exponential accumulation buffer. To do so, it relies on motion vectors stored in the velocity layer of G-buffer. And here is the issue. Velocity layer is an internal resolution, which means that upscaling needed for motion vectors as well. This time we use a bit different but widely adopted upscaling technique called depth-based motion vector dilation. The idea is simple, look for the closest depth sample in the current pixel neighborhood and use motion vector which corresponds to the closest depth sample. After that, we can finally start a projection on the, of the exponential accumulation buffer and other associated buffers. And we will not go into details of the actual reprojection uh, here as it's uh, way beyond the scope of our discussion. But as you can imagine, the upscaling and reprojection processes are quite expensive in terms of ALU operations and registers pressure. In practice, it's measured to take about 40 to 50% of the total temporal pipeline execution time. After a bit of analysis of temporal pipeline internal dependencies, we got an idea to decouple reprojection process with the aim to run it on compute track to save some performance. How the decoupling looks like? Let's start from the graph to remind us how the first iteration of the temporal pipeline looked as for us. Um, with the couple, uh, with the coupling, we go from the from this scheme to this scheme. Here you can notice that uh, scene accumulation process was split in two processes: uh, scene resolving process and scene reprojection process. Green color used here to highlight introduced processes and intermediate buffers. The reprojection parameter buffer is the key resource of the decoupled temporal pipeline. It contains all inputs required by the temporal resolve process. It works to mention that buffer storage is somewhat fat and it's quite some, it requires quite some bandwidth to store the data into it. We run reprojection process on compute track and I had to make sure that there is a good overlapping opportunity within the graphics track. Luckily, we have few passes which are not demanding on bandwidth side, so we decided to overlap the process uh, with them 
there are many arguments being packed in the reprojection parameters buffer, such as reprojected position, min max steps, offsets, and others. And the buffer used to pass these arguments from reprojection step to resolve step. The only input data needed to start temporal reprojection is the gbuffer data. Because of that, we can kick off reprojection process to high priority compute track right after gbuffer task finishes on the graphics track. Leaving the result past the only task of the pipeline running on the graphics track. This decoupling helped us to reduce the wall clock cost of the temporal pipeline by about 0.7 millisecond, which is a great as it reduces the frame critical pass by the exact same number. And those numbers are effective for Xbox One base. Finally, we have the result process which executed as the last dish post processing effect in the stack. It takes data produced by reprojection process and um, and the current frame intermediate buffer to blend them together and to integrate them in the exponential accumulation buffer. To resolve history buffer values taken in previous frames, we use color clamping approach. Unfortunately, because of the content specificities and underlying camera jittering process, the color clamping approach caused a lot of geometry and light flickering for us. We were looking for available solution to combat this issue for some time, but we were not able to find one. In the end, we produced what we call the high confidence color clamping. The high confidence color clamping technique based on confidence buffer. This buffer stores reduced luminance for previous frames up to the full jitter cycle, which is used later to backtrack when color clamping event happened for a specific pixel and to check if color clamping caused by the camera jitter or not. So now how the confidence buffer actually used. This technique starts as a conventional color clamping. We look for the mean max color in the current pixel neighborhood and remember them. Then we read history buffer at reprojected location and check if history value within a range of stored min max colors. If it's within a range, all good, we simply use reprojected history value. If it's not within a the range, then instead of clamping it right away, we compare current frame luminance with the luminance in the previous frame with the same jitter sample position. If luminance matched or within a threshold, then we relax color clamping. If it's not, then this clamping event is legitimate and must be uh, performed. It's worth to mention that this technique doesn't solve all the flickering issues for us, but it helped to reduce geometry and lighting flickering a lot. That's pretty much all considered important techniques we, wa we wanted to cover. And I'd like to share with you a few tips and tricks and learnings we, uh, we gathered throughout the implementation of these techniques. First of all, temporal AA and temporal upscaling are great to enhance visual quality of your game and to keep performance manageable, but they are equally extremely difficult to get them done right. Results produced by this system depend on content a lot. That's why if you are still considering either to add or to enable this technique in your engine, please do it as early as possible and let artists to produce their content with this technique in mind. Second, temporal upscaling technique works well in tandem with dynamic resolution. Unfortunately, dynamic resolution is not the easiest thing to tune and to polish as well. Because of that, please consider adding dynamic resolution on top of established and tested static upscaling solution. This will help you to manage complexity. Third, please consider splitting a unified temporal pipeline to reprojection and resolve sections. It's highly likely that it will bring you some performance savings, which can be used to either bump internal resolution or to adjust quality settings of existing techniques. Finally, experiment with the high confidence color clamping technique if you suffer from the flickering artifacts as we did. So this marks the end of the content I wanted to present to you today. And now let's move to conclusions and final words. And to conclude, We'd like to mention that uh, rendering engines for open world, as well as other generic renders, are extremely complex and demanding. They require a lot of tuning and tweaking and polishing for every new feature. There are no hiding places in open world, so if new feature has a bug or undesired behavior, it will manifest itself somewhere. For this reason, try to stick to solutions with a minimal set of potential each cases and the minimal set of dependencies. Low number of dependencies and interconnections offer great flexibility to restructure a frame architecture if needed, and you will most likely will need it to maximize GPU resources usage. Pursue the goal of using every single bit of, of available hardware. Extra performance can be easily converted to better looking image or richer feature set, which is desired in most cases. Avoid temptation of quick hacks as much as possible and instead look for the root cause of the problem and fix it. Quick hacks are the easiest and the shortest paths to the nightmare of highly coupled systems relying on implicit interconnections. Finally, always keep a good reference and ground truth validation utilities, especially when you work on systems like temporal upscaling, lighting, etc. These references and tools should help you to understand if right problems being solved and if solution is correct.
I'd like to take this opportunity also to mention that if you like what you heard today, or if you're interested in projects we are working on right now, please scan the QR codes or use the link at the bottom of the slide to check for open positions in Ubisoft. Finally, as was mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation, the Watchdog's Legion render is an achievement of the talented group of people. And I want to, thanks to thank many people who helped to make this presentation uh, happen, either by developing the rendering technology or by helping with slides, reviews, etc. Here you'll find a bunch of references used throughout the talk. Please look at this list to find more details regarding a specific technique, system, feature, etc. Also, I encourage you to check the deck once it's live, as it has quite a lot of information in speaker notes, bonus slides, and hidden slides. At this point, I want to say thank you very much for listening, and now I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, and I hope you have some. Thank you.